Hello there, I'm Oscar. Hi there, I'm Nathan. And we're here with the Mendip Hills AONB. Uh, we're volunteer rangers for the Mendip Hills um, and uh, we've had the great privilege of coming and making a set of films about the wonderful and iconic species that we have here on the Mendips. So we hope you enjoy them. So Nathan, it's a beautiful day here out on the Mendip Hills and we're not allowed to say where exactly we are. Why is that? Well today we are having a look at a particular species that is really important on the Mendips and the Mendips is a great stronghold for this particular species and that is the common, well, not so common, European adder. Um, so we're here at a site that is of critical importance to the adders on the Mendip Hills and um, one of their strongholds uh, populations here in the UK um, uh, and because it is so important to the adders we're not going to say exactly where it is that we're at. Uh, lots of the people who are watching this who may be local would probably know where we are. It is a famous spot on the Mendips um, but we're not really going to advertise it too much about where we are today simply because the adders that are here are here because they are hibernating in this area um, and so we need to make sure that they are protected and so that place that they stay, a place called the Hibernaculum, um, is protected and that they're not disturbed too much. Um, and today we're not just here to make a film, we're actually conducting an adder survey um, to look at the number um, of adders that are, are here um, and to help try and keep an eye on uh, the local population. So, uh, should we start having a look? Yeah, let's go and we can find some. All right. So we set off on our adder survey. I'm thrilled to be part of this project with Nathan. I think ever since I was a little boy, I had a fascination with the adder. My hope is to get close enough to an adder to film it, really capture their character on film. And sure enough, after half an hour or so, I spot my first adder tail disappearing into the thicket. It's not exactly David Attenborough stuff yet, but I'm over the moon. Well, one of the things I didn't realise when we started looking for these adders is just how sensitive they are. Every little crack of a twig or heavy footfall seems to alert adders that I haven't even seen yet to make a run for it. The day is getting warmer and warmer and we begin to see more and more adders. With the help of Nathan's keen eyes, it's not long before we find our first up-close encounter. Okay, so we have actually just found something. Yeah, we found an adder down in the uh, scrub down in here, so we're just going to have a look down. She's down in here. Our first up-close sighting, and it's beautiful. It felt incredible to be sharing this place with this special animal. Nathan tells me that due to its smaller size, it's likely to be a male, and the movements of this adder just seem so relaxed. It was just calmly flicking its tongue out and tasting the air, probably trying to get a sense of what we were, watching us with those fantastic red eyes. A really good start to our survey. So Nathan, uh, we're here doing an adder survey for rags, aren't we? We are, so rags is the reptile and amphibi amphibian group Somerset. Um, they um, have asked um, for volunteers to come and um, engage in active surveys of, to look at the adder populations. And luckily I've, I've been given this patch, which is a, a, an adder hotspot. Um, so I'm really pleased about that. Um, so, how, but how do we go about doing a survey? Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, it's about moving through the landscape slowly and quietly looking for the snakes. And the snakes are in particular places because we're here early in the year. This is um, April. Um, and at this point in the year, the snakes have only just come out of their hibernaculum and they're just preparing to move out into the wider landscape to, to, to hunt. Um, 
Uh, and at the moment, what they're doing is that they're basking in the really warm spots. So what we have to do is move through all of this undergrowth, um, through the gorse and the heather uh, and uh, the long grass tussocks, just looking at those nice warm spots where they're nice and sheltered, maybe a bit of bare earth that they can settle on as well. At the entrance, quite often to little tunnels and burrows so they can get away from predators quickly. Um, and see if we can spot them while they're there basking. So I've just spotted an adder on the ground in front of me and uh, if you take a look you can see we've got this beautiful sheltered sunny patch here and then I don't know if you can see but just down in the corner here we've got a hole just there and that goes all the way underground and the snake actually disappeared down into that hole so what I'm going to do, I'm going to wait here really, really quietly with my camera and my bet is when he's calmed down a bit in five or ten minutes, he's going to come back out to this sunny sheltered spot and we should be able to catch him. Nathan politely advised me against trying to wait out a creature that can go months between meals. And maybe he was right, but I wasn't to be discouraged and 15 minutes later, my patience paid off. Adders are ectothermic, uh, and so they actually absorb the sun, uh, their their body heat from the sun and directly from the sun. Some reptiles are able to absorb it from their habitat. Uh, so grass snakes and slow worms, for example, absorb heat from the ground um, after it's been warmed up by the sun, whereas adders actually directly bask in the sun. And when they're basking, they, they sort of flatten their body to get as much of that surface area they visible do. to the sun. They do. So they, they, they try and point all of the darkest bits of their skin towards the sun to, to help them, their muscles warm up um, and to get, gain the energy that they need to then go off and hunt for food. They're also here because in the congregations um, of all these males and females that all share a high vernaculum, there is of course also mating behavior. So the, the females will be mating with the males um, uh, and they'll be basically um, preparing to give birth later on in the year. So some of the snakes that we might see here today uh, are gonna be quite dramatic in their colors because they're in their mating colors as well. One of the things that really amazed me while we were out on the survey was the really quite startling range of colors we saw from very dark, almost black examples, right the way up through to an almost fluorescent sort of green. I hope to catch a glimpse of the mating behaviours and possibly see males and females together. And Nathan said he knew where we might find a larger concentration of individuals, the hibernaculum. So just over the hill here, we've got a uh, hibernaculum um, and that's where the adders stay for their winter. We won't actually be able to see the hibernaculum because it's deep underground, but what we will see is an increase in the number of snakes because they haven't yet travelled far from where they've been hibernating. So what's special about the behaviour in and around the hibernaculum? Uh, uh, so so there, there, there's lots of snakes in the hibernaculum, um, which is quite a, a, a strange thing anyway because we don't really think of snakes as being uh, communal creatures particularly but most definitely over the winter they are um, and it's a very specific place and this is why areas like this are so important is the fact that these hibernaculums might actually contain a whole population of snakes concentrated into one small place and it's a very specific place because they need some very specific requirements so snakes don't really hibernate as such um, not like bears who just go to sleep for three months. These are creatures that, that go into a, uh, a process that's called torpor. Um, and torpor basically means is that they are shut down to such an extent that they're using very, very small amount of energy, but they're still aware enough that they can move about as uh, if, they're, if the requirement is, is for them to do so. So one of the reasons that they might move around is that it gets warmer um, and so the hibernaculum is actually over lots of levels so uh, the coldest parts of the uh, of the winter the snakes will move right down deep 
to maintain that temperature and then as it gets warmer they'll come back up towards the surface uh, and then if it gets cold again they'll go a little bit deeper again and so the hibernaculum has to have this um, very deep um, stratified effect so the snakes can move up and down through that depending on, on what their needs are. Okay so should we go and have a look at it? Yeah, let's go and have a look. Adders are, they give birth to live snakes essentially, don't they? Essentially, yes. It's, uh, they, all, all reptiles lay an egg. Um, but the, the, one of the reasons why the adder is found so far north, it's the most nor northerly found species of, of snakes. Inside the Arctic Circle they've been found, they have, haven't they? Yes, they have. Um, so they, they, get, they, they can deal with quite harsh conditions. And one of the ad adaptations that they have to help them deal with that, um, those conditions is the fact that they don't lay eggs in a nest. The eggs are laid and then the female keeps them inside herself. And then they hatch inside her and she gives birth to a live young. But she's still laid an egg. It's just that she stores it inside her body before they're live young come out and she can have anywhere from two to up to 20 young depending on her size and um, where she is in her reproductive cycle fantastic and then something really amazing happened i was filming a very calm female who was just basking in a small clear area under some bracken you can see she's a female by her relatively large size and her slightly duller brown colours. And as I was sat there just watching her, a smaller, more vividly coloured male just poked his head out of the bracken and then made his move and coiled his body around her. And this was really just incredible to be able to witness this behaviour. It's actually quite a possessive behaviour. The male is basically sending a message to the other males that might happen upon them. She's mine. <laughs> Clear off. And it's amazing to think that this adder here is going to lay the eggs that will hatch and spread out across the mendips and contribute to the genetic diversity of the snakes in the area. So I was really amazed to be able to see this happen in the hibernaculum area. And it was at this point that I very slowly stood up and just left them to it so that I didn't disturb this really critical time in the life cycle of the adder. Well, me and Nathan have moved to a different part of the Mendips now, and um, we're just having a look on this slope to see whether we've got any adders here. And um, we haven't seen any adders yet, but uh, one of the things that we are disturbing quite frequently as we're walking is the common brown lizard. And we know that adders will feed on the lizards. So this area is filled with adder prey. And I think it's only a matter of time before we see an adder on this new slope. So uh, we're going to keep on looking and uh, we'll see if we can get any. So why are we looking here then, Nathan? Why is this habitat perfect for adder? So um, the adder needs lots of different types of habitat during the cycles of its life each year. Um, the habitat that we've got here is perfect. It's very mixed. It has this tussocky grass. It's got the gorse. It's got these pockets and dells um, that are really good shelter for it. And one of the things that has been highlighted as uh, an important cover species for adder is bracken. And there's bracken and if you look at the the pattern of the bracken leaves and then you look at the pattern uh, of uh, camouflage on an adder um, they're strikingly similar um, uh, and so there, there's a high likelihood that you know the presence of bracken is, is quite an important one for adders um, simply because you know it provides them with great um, uh, camouflage uh, protection. As the day warmed up the adders warmed up too and we saw this noticeable change in their behaviours from quite docile basking behaviours that we'd seen earlier in the morning to a lot more linear travel. Some of the adders we encountered later in the day were really moving surprisingly fast and going long distances and this was probably influenced by mating behaviours and seeking female adders. Towards the end of our survey we encountered this adder crossing the path right in front of us 
and it gave us a really good opportunity to see how they move across open ground. But this is quite a vulnerable position for a snake to be in, and they're at risk of attack from birds. Pheasants in particular will predate adders in all stages of their life. This is particularly important because 50 million pheasants are released into our countryside every year, so this is one of the threats they face within their habitat that is primarily caused by humans. It was quite amazing to see how effortlessly this adder was able to find a way up this quite featureless rock face. They're adept at finding those crevices in the rock, and that's in part why the landscape of the Mendips, with its limestone outcrops, is a really perfect habitat for them. So Nathan, one of the features of the Mendip Hills is the dry stone walls that crisscross the top of the Mendip Hills plateau. But we're talking about adders today. Why are dry stone walls important for the adder populations around here? Well, as you can see, they're a really loose structure. And of course, an adder is a snake and so can move through this loose structure quite well. And so actually, these are like uh, snake highways, if you like. They can move through the landscape using this wonderful um, 3D architecture to, to be able to protect themselves from predation. So they do, there are predators that will eat uh, a snake, unsurprisingly. So herons eat snakes, uh, buzzards, um, foxes, dogs. Uh, um, they all um, will eat, eat a snake. So these these walls provide that safety and security to the animals and um, and and also as you mentioned they are interconnecting so one of the things that is really important in wildlife uh, and we're really beginning to understand it more is about the interconnectivity of the sites it's no good having a site that is important for a particular animal over here and then another site for that animal over here if they can't come together and meet because those genetic po uh, populations are, are separated too much. And so these are the uh, ways that our adders are able to move around our landscape. We've got a little bit of an extra on our talk really and our walk around looking at adders. As we've come back from the site we found this adder that's actually been hit by a car. Um, it was crushed so we've taken this opportunity really to pick up a, a dead adder and really get it so everybody can see them much closer um, while they're still because of course that's the trouble with trying to find wildlife is it keeps on moving around and um, so now we've got an adder here so they are of course the UK's only venomous species of snake so inside that mouth there would be fangs to deliver venom. This one I'm pretty sure is a male. It's quite small, the females are much larger than this. Um, and I'll roll him over so we can see the belly plates as well, so you can see the difference between the scales on the belly and the scales on the back. They're much smoother, aren't they? Yeah, so this is these ridged place, plates are how the snake propels itself along. So each of those, it can, as the muscles move down its body, that grips onto the floor. And of course, we can really see that pattern um, on the snake that we were talking about, which is uh, similar to bracken. So you can see that those triangles are very similar to the shape of a bracken leaf. So it's a tragedy to find such a beautiful creature run over but it is the state of things unfortunately us and our cars do kill an awful lot of wildlife but it has given us the opportunity to have a little bit of a closer look at an adder which we wouldn't really have a chance to do. Uh, so what are we going to do with it now? Um, so this snake will now be frozen and it will be given to um, uh, a paleontologist actually who is doing a study at a cave in Ebba um, and she'll basically use the, the bones and skeleton of this snake to help her do comparisons and, uh, and tests for the snake bones that she finds in the cave that she's uh, looking at. So she's going to compare the bones of this modern snake with ancient snake fossils and bones yes. and plot that, that genetic change that's happened to the adder over, over thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, it gives us a chance to do 
some focused research as well. So we'll take advantage of this track. Uh, so we've finished our ADA survey and we're back here at the AOMB office and we had a really successful day. Yeah, we had a really good day. Um, that's 14 or 15 sightings, photographs um, and records for the Reptile Amphibian Group Somerset. So that's a really successful day and we've got to see a really interesting species of creature. And um, we're really, really pleased that you could join us for that trip and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. So goodbye. See you in the next film. Bye. Bye-bye.